Hello, educators. Welcome back to Classroom Conversations, the platform for Georgia's teachers. I'm Ashley Mingwasser, your host in this place for educators to share and to learn. Classroom Conversations is an award-winning podcast series presented jointly by the Georgia Department of Education, Georgia DOE, and Georgia Public Broadcasting, GPB. Today is your tactical training, soldier. We will prepare you to be attention-grabbing, learner-centered, immersive, authentic, and made you look engaging before a student audience. Now drop your burdens and give me 20 deep breaths. This training is going to be intensively relaxed. We're running chill drills for the classroom with the combined powers of our two teacher guests. Today's training in just three words, phenomena-based instruction. By harnessing powers of observation, phenomena-based instruction brings content to life. For a first look at this, just go back and listen to episode 310. What does phenomenon look like in math and science? That's what we're exploring today and why tell you when I can show you this is the way of phenomena. I've got two phenoms beside me, actually. She's a doctor of chemistry. Dr. Megan Higgins is going into her 25th year in education. Megan is a celebrated high school chemistry teacher at Cartersville High School in Cartersville City Schools District. She's paired with beloved 24-year teacher, Corey Colby, whom I keep trying to call Colby Calais. But Corey has the upper hand in high school math, where she teaches in Gwinnett County Public Schools at Central Gwinnett High School. Corey has taught in multiple states, so like Colby Calais, she's basically been on tour. Welcome, Megan and Corey. <laughs> Hello. How yeah. are you? Good. You doing well? <laughs> we are. My first prompt is to ask you to say phenomena-based instruction 10 times fast. Just kidding. We're not going to actually make you do that. One of you were telling me, this is, this is a really big mouthful, phenomena-based instruction. Phenomena or phenomenon? How should, we, how should we say? If it's plural or singular. If it's plural or singular. Phenomena for plural, phenomenon for singular. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Megan, the mascot at your school, is it is it the hurricane? It is. Of Go course. Canes. Go Kane. So you're teaching at a school with a phenomenon for a mascot. Yes. It, it's very mm -hmm. fitting. Awesome. What compelled you to become an educator? My family. I grew up with parents, both educators. My sister's an educator. My uncle was a principal. Um, my grandparents worked in the schools. So I thought that was like the only job I could have <laughs> at one point. I just happened to also be good with science. <laughs> and as you told so, me before, education is hard. What do you mean by that? Um, you're dealing with a lot of different aspects. As an educator, you're not just teaching up in front, you know, teaching chemistry. You're, you're teaching your kids almost every aspect of their life. All the hats. Mm -hmm. And you, Corey, what compelled you into education? Uh, growing up, you know, you have those make-believe games of, you know, playing house, playing dress-up, and mine was playing school with my brother. <laughs> with your brother. <laughs> yes, yeah, so different ways of torturing the younger sibling. <laughs> um, but no, I just fell in love with the helping people and wanting to continue that and being inspired by a couple of teachers in high school. Um, and so when I went to college, I just didn't know exactly what I wanted to teach and then fell in love with more of the math side versus the language arts. And so that's where I am today now. Here you are, 24 yeah. years later. Yes. Corey, you are somewhat <laughs> of a celebrity, I think I can uh. say. I looked you up and I found you in a YouTube interview. Uh, who is that with? Uh, that was Dr. Christopher Childs. He's a math educational consultant out of Orlando, Florida. He had reached out to her, but she was no longer in the classroom. And so she had given him my name and he just reached out and you had a nice one-on-one, yeah. -on -one. but it was a wonderful interview, and I learned I learned a lot more about you. Well, thank you. Um, one thing I would like to know that I don't think was covered fully by that interview is what is your favorite thing about teaching mathematics? Oh, uh, it's getting kids to enjoy it. After years of having not the best experience with math, that I hear multiple times that they enjoy the class. They've enjoyed how I've taught class and just the different things that I do in the classroom to help them have an enjoyable experience. Their engagement, mm -hmm. which we'll talk a lot about today. Megan, what is your favorite thing about teaching science? It's basically the same thing. It's yeah. 
you know, with science, you have the ability to do so many different labs and experiments and instead of just sitting or talking. And to me, just you can use things hands on. Yeah. You know, all the hands on activities and letting the kids have a little bit of fun where sometimes they look at me and like, really, we're going to we're going we to light a Bunsen burner. We're going to play with fire. <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. Are we going to get to blow up anything No, But uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not the new building. <laughs> yeah. Making it engaging. Well, let's let's dig into that. You know what a phenomenon is. You'll define this for us soon. But in short form, is a phenomenon all of these things? Feel free to chime in with a yes or no to each bullet. First, a phenomenon is visually intriguing. Yes or no? Yes. Most times. Yes. Okay. A phenomenon is easily understood. Yes or no? Not no. necessarily. Okay, cool. We want it to be... Far reaching. Okay, complex. Mm -hmm. We want to understand and uh, explore. Mm -hmm. uh, third, a phenomenon is a fictitious occurrence. can be something fantastical. Oh, God, no. no. Oh, God, this no, real. she says. <laughs> this is real Sorry. life. Gosh, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> what is it then? It's, it's naturally occurring yeah. instead. Okay. Mm -hmm. And fourth and finally, a phenomenon is interdisciplinary. Yes. Yes. Yes, obviously. We've got mm -hmm. math and science <laughs> repped here in the room. Could be any subject, though. Mm -hmm. True. Yep. Should mm -hmm. be any subject. Correct. Bring Might in have. the literacy. Bring in the history. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. What? I mean, obviously, with me, I have to bring in math. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. What phenomena are you interested in in real life, professionally or personally? I try to go more towards the natural stuff. Um, lately, my, my habits have been going towards the farming and sustainability or climate type stuff or environmental. Um, so if I'm looking at on my farm, even last night I was having a conversation about why I add apple cider vinegar to my water collection system for Look my chickens. That. Um, and that's all science-based. That's all chemistry. But, you know, when you look at just natural phenomenon out in the earth, um, there's the pink lake out in Australia oh, yeah. that has like pink bacteria and algae that's growing or the, I forget what it's called. Like it's like a blood red river that comes through Antarctica and it's all the iron deposits that are coming up, you know? So it's, it's bringing in the chemistry, but it's like people don't understand why it looks the way it is, but it's capturing. Yeah. Eye, eye capturing, you know, that's the entry point mm -hmm. into the exploration. What about you, Corey? What phenomena are you interested in? A lot of it's the patterns in nature, you know, like looking at a sunflower and seeing, you know, the Fibonacci sequence within that or... Spoken like a true math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> or the golden spiral in seashells and just, I love, I've always also loved fractals, which is kind of like a, think about a snowflake and how oh, yeah. it just, and that it's always wanted to explore that and I just have, like, unfortunately never had the time to, I feel like. In my studies and stuff, and so I feel like I, I need to do something of that nature. You need to look up. It's called, like, ice. What are they called? Ice candles. Oh, And it's, what? like, how the ice will, like, fracture over the surface oh, it's so of cool. the water. And then there's another one. It's, like, the ice finger of death. Oh. And it, like, it now has, we're talking. has that frozen, <laughs> like, it gets really cold, and it comes down. It shoots all the brine out of the water, but it, it just keeps going down. But it keeps growing Oh. And it has like all the like the growth pattern right. would be really neat with the crystals. Oh, cool! Oh, yeah, I'll thanks. For, I'm sorry. Thanks. No, no, no. Thank we're, ner you. we're nerding out uh, yeah. <laughs> for that illuminating tip. I think for me, I'm very interested in anything astronomy. You know, if there's an eclipse, lunar or solar phases of the moon, love that stuff. Mm -hmm. Also, really into decomposition. Maybe a fascination with the macabre. Yes. <laughs> Disturbing. Oh, I know. Yes. We'll move on. But as phenomenal people, I want to know what your hobbies and fascinations are. Megan, we'll start with you. <laughs> you said you live on a farm. Do tell. Yes. We just recently bought a hobby farm. And so we are raising fiber goats. We have Angora goats and uh, baby doll sheep. How many sheep? Right now, currently two, but I pick up my third <gasps> on Monday. Then you'll be three sheep to the wind. <laughs> as they say, a little adaptation of that expression. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. You, you are funny. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> you. You have sheep. You have goats. Who else lives there? We have... Chickens. Chickens. We are up to about 16 chickens. Ch hens. You know, hopefully they're all hens at this point. Um, <laughs> we have a couple of livestock dogs, Pyrenees. We have German oh. shepherds. And then recently a poodle and a 
Bernice Mountain Dog. Oh my gosh, we need to visit your farm, Corey. Yeah. What are your hobbies? Oh, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of the opposite and take a. <laughs> The relaxed, enjoy the summer break of a teacher. I like that. Life. <laughs> now we know how you spend your summer breaks. So, yes. Uh, between reading and crafting and spending time with my adorable grandson. So oh. that's the extent of my free time. And you are a Netflix champion, I also understand. I, I, I pride myself, yes. <laughs> Amassed a lot of content there. Is there an inspiring expression for each of you that captures the crux of your work in the classroom that you really just resonate with? The quote of chance favors the prepared mind. Chance favors the prepared mind. And just the idea that we don't always know what's going on out there, but we need to have enough background knowledge to help explain it. Yeah. And to be able to jump with possible solutions for what's going on. Corey? Um, after our conversation earlier, I was like, oh, wait, no, this is a better one that I, um, mistakes are expected in my classroom. Mm. <laughs> and so I want them to mess up because that, m quote unquote, messing up helps them learn and realize that life is about those times where you mess up and you make those mistakes. And how do you learn from that? What lesson can you take from it and move forward? What, how can you use that situation you know, in the future. I'm seeing an unexpected entryway sign at your door in my mind now. <laughs> Mistakes welcome here. Yes. You know, it's just you're inviting students to, to what is it, what do they say, fail forward, uh, kind of propelling their learning. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's let that transition us into our conversation about each of your classrooms. What is a phenomenon in math and in science? Can we start with you in math, Corey? Um. So teaching AP statistics to get the chance for the kids to hopefully in find those topics that they are interested in and then dive into the data and then, of course, you know, use that to become more statistically literate. And so that's where we're kind of, you know, using different graphs and different nature, um, however they, you know, whether it's in, in something that they're interested in at school or in the environment or in their lives or just society. And so getting them engaged in that and then hopefully throughout that process of our statistical process, getting them you know, more statistically literate. They can offer up the fodder. So what does that look like? Can you give us an example? Oh, um, use a variety of tools, um, but when they just, you know, open up that engagement with a, a graph, there's a couple of sources um, like the what's going on in this graph with the New York Times oh. where you can pull up a graph and just show it to the kids and it just gets them engaged and asking them about, well, what do you see in that graph? And without even telling them what the graph's about or what data was collected or anything, just getting that entry point into and getting them engaged in what they're seeing. Before you actually dive into the nitty gritty. Well, that mm -hmm. makes sense. And for you, Megan, what does a phenomenon look like in your science classroom? use it a lot for introducing like an inquiry lab or um, just interest introducing like the content that we're looking at um, where I can use a, a picture to bring up and the picture um, connects into what we're learning about in the classroom. Um, I'm trying to give an, think of an example that would help. We were starting atoms and every kid will start to groan in high school when they hear atoms because you have to now learn about protons, neutrons, electrons, which you have done since probably fourth grade. Right. My, my mom's fourth grade science teacher, and yeah. she did this. My dog ate that yeah. science project in elementary <laughs> school, actually, yes. I recall. All the pretzels gone. So, you know, I, I introduced it this year with um, different types of nails. And being on the farm and being the person that's always out there building everything, either inside, outside, oh. I've gotten into the realm of learning what type of nails to use for different situations. So I just kind of browsed and just t brought it up on topic with the kids. You know, who's ever worked on a construction project with your parents or you've been out there building something? And, you know, a couple of the kids who were like, you know, their heads are down. They're like, oh, this is going to be horrible. I got to talk about proton being positive again. <laughs> um, you know, they all perked up like. I have. I've done this. And then they, they start to actually make that connection to something. And then we started to build on to, well, why do we use certain nails outside versus the nails that we're using inside instead? Cost comparative, how much they're going to react with different things. Um, it just helps them make those connections to what they're, what and why they're doing things. Right. 
So I, I do a lot of the, the labs later. You know, then we'll actually look at the activity series and we'll pull the different metals and they'll, they'll start to play with that and try to determine the, the why of it. So it really piques interest, mm -hmm. it sounds like. Well, onto the how of this, the process of harnessing uh, this type of instruction. How do you draw phenomenon into your science and math instruction? Um, is, is it something you're thinking about all the time? Is there, is there a guidebook <laughs> you use? How do you do this? How does a teacher start? <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> go ahead, Corey. Um, in math. In math, I mean, one of the first things, always ask the kids. You know, there's always a beginning back to school act, um, questionnaire. survey questionnaire that I give them and I always ask them like different things that they might be interested in or if, you know, where they've traveled or, you know, just a whole variety of questions that could gather some data that we could then use later on. Or if there's topics that they're interested in, that could be something that they could put on there. Um, and then once we kind of have that, there's some couple of sources that are like my go-tos for at least in AP statistics. Um, Stats Medic and Skew the Script are both uh, t been developed by some experienced AP statistics teachers. And they use that idea of engagement where they have a prompt and then it kind of builds on that um, from that prompt using it to then um, use the give you the instruction and learn the, the main ideas that you're trying to get across. So for you, it's really about first looking for those points of intersection, which mm -hmm. I think a math teacher can appreciate that pun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah. On to you, Megan, the how. Well, how do you harness phenomena in your science instruction? I'll talk parallel to what she's saying here is the <laughs> same exact <laughs> idea of, you know, again, using that questionnaire. Get to yeah. know your kids, get to know what they're interested in. And like she said, perfect point, see where they've been. Mm -hmm. ah. Because if they can, you know, you're going to have kids who maybe haven't been outside of that town, but they may have also been to different places in the town, at least, so that you can make those connections. Where do they work? Mm -hmm. Draw some connections to work. Mm -hmm. um, but then second is I, not every teacher, and this is you know one of those helpful hints for later with teachers, is not every teacher knows all this stuff off the top of your head. Mm -hmm. you got to go in and you do some research. Yeah. You go to those websites. You, um, I really hate to say it, but TikTok has some <laughs> amazing <laughs> little um, things you can follow. They do. And you can... <laughs> You know, if you stay with what you're following, you, yeah. you can hit a bunch of different um, great sources. Just for a spark of an idea. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that spark can then lead you to something else. Yes. You know, once right. you're looking at one, then you start to spur off. And, you you know, you go down mm -hmm. the rabbit hole, and you can be going down there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully Alice comes and gets us eventually. <laughs> but... Um, you Before know, you it's, become a mad hatter. I, I yeah. hate to say, well, we're all a little mad, I think, around here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, you know, you... You kind of cheat. I, I hate to say cheating it, but you do. You you go out there, you use resources that other teachers have prepared, and mm -hmm. people have sites out there based on this for you. Yeah. And but you just you got to do a little legwork. Um, yeah, and see what works. But you're starting with student background, which I find very interesting. How do you effectively plan for phenomena based teaching? How much time does it take? When do you do it? What is your planning routine? <laughs> That's what summer's for. <laughs> <laughs> um. I know for my, sometimes it's more, sometimes on the cuff. And so it's like we, something maybe they brought up the day before, a question they may have asked. And I'd be like, oh, that sounds like a great topic for tomorrow. In which case then, you know, spend some time after school looking for maybe some graphs to talk or data sets that have already been compiled, research that's already been done. And then we can then use that in the classroom mm -hmm. or, you know, use that as a future idea for a project that they can then do on their own to show their understanding of the material. Yeah. How do you plan, Megan? I do some of the same, and then it's mostly I'm looking back at their their standards. What What is essential to me and what is my core idea? And from the core ideas, I start to brainstorm, like, what are some of the connections I can use? Um, and once I have those connections and I can bring them back to that standard for them, then I go in and I look for my labs. Like I, you, uh, any science teacher most likely has a binder or binders full of labs, but we don't do them all. But we can go in and we can edit some of those to make it more inquiry-based easily or make it more phenomenon, like an engagement, just something to get them started and to make a connection back to the standard. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not stuff that you're reinventing the wheel, but you're just kind of going to go in and tweak. But it's a constant 
I mean, you're constantly doing it. You mm-hmm. know, if you're watching Netflix, yeah. you know, you're, <laughs> you're looking at that like, and you're yeah. like, oh, hey, I yeah. got something. <laughs> yeah. So it's just an ongoing openness. You're kind of receiving that stimuli from your world and taking it into your classroom. I know with just each of your subjects, there's quite a bit of cross-pollination between math and science in your classrooms, mm-hmm. I can imagine. <laughs> can you give me some uh, sample lessons that you've used, Corey, Megan? Um there was an article that I had been given at a conv- or a workshop, and so it talked about the number of deaths and seatbelt use. And so mm. looking at that data that was collected, and so it just sparks the conversations in class um, about the experimental p- piece of it. You know, mm. you know, how did they go through that? You know, was it an actual experiment? Did they have people... Megan's not a proof of this. <laughs> yeah, um, crashing their cars and harming themselves, which is not humane. No, you know, or was it more observational, where they were kind of standing off to the side, collecting their data that way, um, and so it just sparks all of those initial conversations about gathering data, as well as seeing how it kind of combines with the um, experimental process that they also see in science. And I'll piggyback off of Corey's seatbelt lab where we have a a mole ratio lab that we do. And the kids have to go through and use just basic vinegar, baking soda, and try to get the proper ratio. So they know how much vinegar, how much baking soda is reacting together. We can gather all the results as a class. And then the kids can look at that data that they've looked at at a class and try to figure out what the best ratio is for that. And then they build a basically an airbag in a little... Folgers coffee cup container and drop an egg. Not one for my hens. <laughs> I'll buy those from the store. But, um, you know, they drop an egg and try to make the perfect airbag based on that proper ratio that they've looked at with the class data. But I bet that there are some sort of partners uh, in this. What people should you seek to be a thought partner in your planning process? Uh, mine is all online, honestly. Online people. Yeah, there's been a huge community of math teachers on qu- Twitter, and it's um, MTBOS, um, if you do that hashtag. And it's just over the years, that group, that community that has been established. And so it's one where I can just ask a question or even so some of those uh, conversations can happen on other social media platforms as well. And so there's just a lot of support, at least in the AP statistics community online. And so I know those are available. And so if I have an idea where be like, oh, has someone tried this? Or does someone have data that could support this? You know, there's They're like your think tank. Exactly. Because I don't know about Megan, but I know like I'm kind of isolated teaching what I teach. And so I do have to find those other people, those other resources. And so that's where I've gone is online. Yeah, same. In chemistry, I'm usually one of the only chemistry teachers in a school. So, um, you know, I go online. Online groups have saved me the last few years Mm -hmm. with technology and everything with increased stuff, sharing. We've all just become a huge sharing group, you know. Um, And then getting out and looking at your CTA teachers. Uh, they have a world of knowledge. And sometimes the academic and the, the VOTEC get separated. Oh. But you've got to make sure you go out because a lot of those, especially at the school I'm at right now, they have had other careers. They've been out mm. there doing the real stuff while we're just teaching it. Um, you know, and they can share that a little bridge. Bit. And a lot of times, the, I hate to say it, but the kids a lot of times will tell me, you mm-hmm. know, that kind of thing, what they're doing in other classes. And my last go-to person is my husband. <laughs> um, I know. Shout out. Shout <laughs> yeah. out to hubby. I'll have to make sure he listens to this. <laughs> um, but he's worn so many different hats. You know, he's gone from one career to the next. And he's probably one of the smartest guys I know. Wow. Um, yeah, he has probably more credits, college credits, than I do combined. <laughs> and he, you're a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and I tell him that, too. He thinks he's just not that smart. But um, he has a plethora of just ideas and knowledge yeah. you know talking about sonar tech and how we can get, relate that even into the pressure under the ocean yeah and, and everything else it's just he he ties a lot back for what i can do in the classroom and that's a great places. that's a great lead to think mm-hmm. of people with just other careers you know community mm-hmm. partners around you that you have access mm-hmm. to you might know somebody who works in meteorology or somebody who does this and then you can kind of uh, use their expertise to weigh in on the subject 
being such a highly demonstrative experiential approach, uh, what shifts in instruction must be made in order to utilize phenomenon-based teaching? It's a bit of a paradigm shift, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be comfortable getting off the stage. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be able to kind of let the kids just question. Try not to give them answers because, like, you know, as teachers, we try to always tell everybody what we know. But you've got to sit back and let the kids figure it out. You know, question them and just question. Let them work it through. Um, that's a huge, I think, to me, you know, I have to always rein myself back in. You know, don't give them too much information. Um, and then you have to be ready to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, even one of the phenomenon I used this past year, I completely failed. But we sat and we worked it out and we tried to figure out what, you know, because I used a phenomenon of the orange with the balloons and trying to pop it, mm -hmm. going into different types of bonding and stuff, um, intermolecular forces, to be honest. Um, but we, we worked it out. And every the next day the kids came in. All right, did we figure out what we we're doing with this? And I'm like, okay, well, we got some more. You know, you told me to get some more balloons. You told me to get this because I had old balloons. Um, so we, we tried a bunch of different things and went through it. We still didn't get it. But then again, a couple days ago, I saw on one of the Facebook groups that I'm in, you know, someone actually proposed an explanation. I was like, that is exactly what I think I was doing wrong. There you go. So unfortunately, I don't have those kids anymore. And I wish I could go in and be like, this is what we're doing, guys. We yes. figured it out. <laughs> well, it's it's the it's the lesson of tenacity, the stick to itness that is part of this. Even mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you stuck in there and they kept coming back each day asking for follow up. And it's embarrassing because, you know, you are an educated person in yeah. front of them, you know, honors kids a lot of times, too. And it's like. Oh, man, I can't believe this is not going the way it's supposed to go. But yeah, like but you pointed out, this has to be naturally occurring. It mm -hmm. is not fictitional. So we have to make it happen. And in nature, mm -hmm. things don't always go as planned. That's exactly right. Because unfortunately, we don't control nature. It's just talk to the mosquitoes. You just have to be that. prepared <laughs> to explain and figure out why. Exactly. Well, exactly. mistakes we know are welcome in Corey's <laughs> yes. classroom. Uh, what shifts have you had to undergo <laughs> uh, to teach this? Um, a lot of what Megan said and big thing is my own mindset and then realizing that um the whole changing the approach in classroom is that you know if i was bored delivering material at the front of the room how boring was it for them to, <laughs> to sit receive and receive it exactly <laughs> and so i needed them to be more engaged to take that ownership in their own learning and so just become more responsible in the classroom and so those again those life skills that mm -hmm. they can transfer to anything that they may do after high school. What are the benefits to engaging phenomena-based teaching for students and teachers? Can you think of one for each? More relevant. You're figuring out why you have to learn this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, instead of just learning it to learn, you're, you now know, you have that connection. And it's like, oh, okay, that, that's why. That's why that yeah. happens. I always joke to the kids, I'm like, you know, someday you might have kids and you're going to have to explain why this happens because yeah. they're going to ask you why, 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 why 15 times. Yeah. And you got to be prepared. So you might as well learn. <laughs> exactly. To answer the why question, but then just to give my own self the spark of learning new things. And so it just, you know, if I'm enjoying learning, I want to mm -hmm. transpose that to the students as well. Right. It's the whole bring to life piece of this. How does phenomenon-based teaching support authentic teaching and learning? I feel like this type of instruction is uniquely authentic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how it's not. Yeah. You know, when you're looking at something that's real life and it's connecting straight back to prior experiences that they've had, you know, they, they have that real connection, whether it's cultural or um, a prior experience in like a job, mm -hmm. um, somewhere they've been, visited, um, you know, it's... It, it connects straight back to it. I, I don't even know if there, how else you can explain that. So it gets over that hump of why do we have to learn this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which, you know, these days it's expected that there has to be some relevance. Exactly. Yeah. But it also gives them that ownership of their own learning, you know, so that they can, like you said, answer those why questions for their kids in 10 years. Yeah. Or who knows what they're going to end up having as a job or what m something might spark their interest in college and be like, oh, I remember something that was said in my stat class or in my chemistry class. Maybe that could, you know, lead them down those paths that they just didn't know. To their career. Exactly. That's amazing. Do you have any words of encouragement or advice for our teachers listening 
who may not have tried phenomena-based teaching yet. What do you have to say? I mean, we've said a couple. Like, one is be prepared to fail. Mm. You know, you, you've got to be comfortable learning from your own mistakes, too, in front of kids. Um, don't be afraid to use things that are already prepared. That's mm-hmm. why teachers are putting it out there is to help others. Be prepared to make a mess, which makes me very uncomfortable because I'm a neat freak. Like, this could get messy, <laughs> phenomena-based learning, right? Yes. Your classrooms could get a little messy. Do you keep a broom on hand? Oh, gosh, yes. Yes, absolutely. And a broken glass container. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the, sci- in the science classroom. And what- it's usually me breaking it. <laughs> <laughs> what words of encouragement do you have, Corey, um, for math well, teachers? Along the lines of what Megan said is, you know, change your change your mindset. And so if you're... If your mind isn't there to try to do what's uh, better for the kids in your classroom, then, you know, they're not going to benefit. And so and then seek out those that, you know, are like minded. And so, like, I know I have found my own little community online, um, various social media platforms. And so within that community have also established real life, you know, in person relationships as well so I can pick up my phone and text I mm-hmm. be like wait a minute I don't know that answer let me text my friend real quick and see <laughs> if she knows and so you know just having that support to you know make the mistakes but yet also encourage the students that mistake learn you know is part of their learning my, my other um yeah, I was going to say that's funny because I actually tell the kids <laughs> a lot of times oh I'm just going to ask my little face group hive here uh-huh. and they're like you what do you have a Facebook thing of all teachers? I'm like, yes, yes we do. <laughs> um, but my last thing I was thinking is um, start with the unit you really like. Mm-hmm. You know, when mm-hmm. you're talking about tip. bringing your enthusiasm, yeah. if kids can see you liking it. So, you know, dive into that unit that you really have a passion for and you know you already love to teach it. Start with that one because you probably already know a lot and then you can build on it. And then mm-hmm. take it every other unit. Don't think you're going to do every single unit in one year, especially as a newer teacher. You know, go every other and then start to build more in. And as you get more comfortable, you're going to start to see all the ideas just start to, you know, you, you'll actually have too many. And yeah. you'll have to, like, actually yeah. sit and say, okay, which ones do I really want to do? Yeah. Well, that's um, a wonderful problem to have. Uh, right. let, let's leave them with something prescriptive Sorry. here at the end. Uh, <laughs> a tip or a cool trick to kick off a phenomenal phenomena based classroom. Anything in mind? Yeah. Well, you can like point to your resources. I say like Megan said it's, you know, pick something that you enjoy and it's not something you have to do every day. Right. As well. So it's like when you go into these using mm-hmm. these different learning techniques with your children and you think that, oh, I've got to do x y and z every day with every class period. It's just unrealistic. Right. Have realistic so, cool. expectations. Yeah. Exactly. And so and then find find that common group. Find your find your people. And so whether that be the person next door to you, across the hall, even someone in a different discipline. There is a good could idea. Help you because I know like, you know, math and science Connections. are very relatable to mm-hmm. each other. And salt so, and pepper. Exactly. And so to go down the hall and talk to my chemistry friend. Or the physics person, because that's where they're seeing the application of what we're learning in class. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any last words, Megan, about phenomena-based instruction for you, Dr. Higgins? Come back around to her little mistakes <laughs> are expected. Yes. Yeah. The whole last year until about March, I was taken down a Bolton board, and I looked at it, and it was like, you know, if at first you don't succeed, you're normal. <laughs> I like and that. I'm taking like it, it down, and, and this is March. I put it up in August. And I start noticing, oh, I didn't spell succeed right. <laughs> <laughs> that's for the English episode. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's mistakes, you guys. You're, you're going to be good at one thing. You're not going to be good at everything. You've both mentioned a variety of sources that you use to support phenomena-based instruction. Some is social media. How mm-hmm. do you know what's a good resource and what's not? I think it's one of those things we still need to be also teaching our kids is you need to make sure that you are finding reputable sources Mm -hmm. and how you go in and um, actually dissect what is a proper source and what's not a proper source. You know, I mentioned TikTok. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, Everything on true. Everything on TikTok is is true, right? Yeah, <laughs> according to our students. So it's it's well, how you're to, just getting ideas there, right? Yeah, it's yeah. how to get a lot of those and make sure that we're making them actually being, what's the word? Um, not true, you know, true, but um, unbiased, unbiased opinions mm-hmm. and something that's factual, um, research based, 
evidence-based that we can use. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then the other thing is I, I, for new teachers, use the, use the DOE website. Mm -hmm. You know, between GPB, DOE, there's a lot of resources out there already for teachers that are trying to find some, and those sources have already been vetted for us. And, we and are know, ready to use. And they are ready mm -hmm. to use. So you do not have to go in. I mean, you can eventually make it your own if you want to put your own spin on it, but that's always there for you, and that's what they're there for, is for you to use them and abuse them. That's well, true. maybe not abuse them, but yeah. <laughs> definitely use them. Yes. <laughs> And I can attest to the math ones I've worked with. So I know that those are there as well. And then mm -hmm. especially with the new updated standards they did for math. And so those are available, which are free, which is great for teachers when we hear that word free. Free <laughs> online, meaning you can access it on any of your smart devices. Thank you, Dr. Megan Higgins and Corey Colby. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Have, you. you have both definitely put in the reps on this skill. And I'm so glad, Megan, you ignored your mother's warning about becoming an educator. And Corey, thank you for experimenting on your brother <laughs> as your first ever pupil. Uh, the state's education system thanks your family for their sacrifice, and we thank you for your service. So may you rest honorably until your next day in the classroom. <laughs> we need you. And to our teachers listening out there, soldier on. Keep your instruction lively and captivatingly immersive by drafting phenomena-based instruction into the fold. Your students will love you even more with bigger smiles and better understanding that says you're a great teacher. I'm Ashley, and you're dismissed. Report for duty next Tuesday, 0900 hours. For more Classroom Conversations content, goodbye for now. Funding for Classroom Conversations is made possible through the School Climate Transformation Grant. 